the church is right now. We are in the secret place hid from the world. Let me, get, let me give you that scripture I just quoted to you. Let's go to Ephesians chapters numbers 2, and we want verses numbers 22, I believe it is. The world does not understand what we have because he's tucked us away, and unless a man comes to him by faith, they will never be able to understand. You believe that tonight? And many of us, before we were born again, we looked at the church as an odyssey, as an enigma, as it were. Amen? Let me see what verse I want. I told you, didn't I? Ephesians. I know I said Ephesians 2 and verses 22. Yes, let's go back to verses numbers uh, 19. We're talking about the secret place here. Read. Now, therefore, ye are no more strangers and foreigners, but fellow citizens with the saints in the household of God. This is where we're at right now. We are no more strangers. The Bible said in one place, ye who were afar off, he has made somebody say nigh. He's brought us nigh. How did he do that? He did it through, no doubt, our faithful father Abraham. And we are now children of Abraham, somebody say, by faith. We've been brought nigh. Can the church say praise the Lord? Verses numbers 20, what did he say? And are built upon the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone. Now let's back into the text here. What did he say? He says, first of all, as we back into this, Jesus is the chief cornerstone. A cornerstone is the first stone that is laid on the foundation of any building. It is the stone in which every stone in any building gets its origin. Now, in this verse, Jesus is two things. He is the foundation. He is also the measurement by which everybody that will be in the building gets their origin from. Psalms chapters 118 verse 22 says that the stone which, which the builders discarded has become the head of the corner. You know who, that's, who that stone was? It was Jesus. And when that stone showed up, they threw him away. Praise the Lord. The builders in that text was Israel. They were supposed to be building with him, but they threw him away. And one man said it like this, another man's junk is another man's treasure. He is a diadem of beauty as it were. And we picked him up, and he is the foundational piece of the New Testament church. Then he says here, we are built upon the foundation of the apostles. That has to do with the New Testament. The apostles were the foundation layers of the New Testament church. This is the reason why we call ourselves apostolic. We are Pentecostal in experience, and we are apostolic in practice or in doctrine. We are built upon the foundation of the apostles' doctrine, that is, the New Testament. And they had the responsibility, no doubt, saints, to write the New Testament scriptures and to lay the foundation. And once they did that, that office was a closed book. Can the church say praise, praise the Lord? Then he says here also the prophets. This has to do with the Old Testament. So the church is built upon the old and the new. In the Old Testament, Jesus is concealed. In the New Testament, he is what? Revealed. Now, this is not a part of our Bible study, but I guess I have to give you this. In our foundation, there are six principles of our foundation. You guys know that found at? Hebrews chapters number six, verses one and two. We are built upon the, we are built upon the foundation of the apostles' doctrine, no doubt, but the scripture said that um, repentance from dead works, Faith toward God, the doctrine of baptisms, plural, doctrine of laying on of hands, as it were, resurrection of the dead, and eternal judgment. These are the planks. Anybody knows what a political platform is? There's a platform which has to do with the foundational message of any political, how can I say, any political outfit. But within their political belief system, they have planks. They have, which are called what we would call values. In the church, 
we have six planks, and they make up the foundation upon which we are built upon. That's not our subject, but let's move on to verses numbers uh, 21. And what did he say here? In whom all the building, that's the church, fitly framed together. So the building is in one place. We're going to read here. It is in a holy inhabitation of God through the Spirit. The Bible calls us in the book of 1 Peter chapter 2, Sister Delpha, we are lively stones in the building. He is the chief cornerstone. We are lively stones in somebody say the building. Can the church say praise the Lord? Together groweth, he says, uh, together groweth unto a holy temple in the Lord. The temple of the Lord is holy. Read verses numbers um, 22. This is the verse we wanted to get to. In whom ye also are builded together for inhabitation of God through the Spirit. So the secret place is an inhabitation of God through the Spirit. And right now, we are in that place, and it's a secret place, inasmuch as it is hidden from the wise and prudent and revealed unto babes. You and I are babes. We come into the church as babes in Christ. We mature, we grow into mature children of God. Two terms. One has to do with babes. The other one has to do with children. We never outgrow our God. Can the church say praise the Lord? Now let's get back into what we want to uh, deal with. Let's go back to, uh, let's see here, Psalms 91. Let me give you some, some more detail on this particular. I'm, we, I don't know how long this is going to take me, but I'm going to take my time. All right. He says, verses number two, and I will say of the Lord, he is my refuge and my fortress. The Bible said the name of the Lord is a strong tower. That's in the book of Proverbs. The righteous run in and are what? Safe. We are in him right now. My God, in him will what? I trust. Verses number three. Surely he shall deliver thee from the snare of the fowler and from the noisome pestilence. Read. He shall cover thee with his feathers and under his wings Shall thou trust? And he, uh, he says, and his truth shall be thy shield and buckler, and thou shalt not be afraid for the terror by, uh, by night, nor the arrow that flies by day, nor for the pestilence that walketh in darkness, nor for the destruction that wasteth in noonday. Read here. A thousand shall fall. At thy side and ten thousand at thy right hand, but it shall not come nigh thee. Now this is a this is a powerful statement. This is prophecy. Now remember this, saints, that when the tribulation takes takes place, God is going to call us out of the earth. We're not going to go through the tribulation period. Let me give you that scripture. Let's go to let's go to Isaiah, chapters numbers uh, twenty six. Let me show you this in your Bible. Praise the Lord. This has a dual meaning, no doubt. And then I'm going to show you what God is going to do for Israel. Isaiah 26. And verses numbers um, 20. Now, it would be impossible for District Elder Raider Johnson to give you all these scriptures in three days. But we're going to give you a little bit more detail. All right, what did he say? Come, my people. My people here, this is the church. What you're going to read here is the rapture of the church. So when he says in, in Psalms 91 that it shall not come nigh our dwelling, that has to do with the church. It's not going to come nigh us. Why? Because we're going to be here. He says, come, you, uh, come, my people, enter into thy chambers. This chambers here, saints, is heaven. Read. Shed thy door about thee. And hide thyself, as it were, for a little moment. That little moment is seven years. Now, you're going to read. If we go to it today, you'll read in the fourth chapter of the book of Revelation. It talks about a door was open in heaven, if memory serves me correct. That's the rapture of the church. We're going to be in heaven. So we're going to see this, what the psalmist was talking about, happening down here on the earth from our chambers. Our chamber will be in heaven. 
Israel is going to see his saints happening down here. Those who don't take the mark of the beast, because the Bible said all Israel shall be saved. The rebels will be purged out the first three and a half years of tribulation. They're going to see it from the wilderness. And you know what the type of that was? The type of that in your Bible was when God took the children of Israel, when he sent the ten plagues uh, in Israel. Israel was no doubt a type of the world. He sent the ten plagues, and he punished the inhabitants of the world, or Egypt, while he protected the children of Israel in the land of Goshen. Not one plague came nigh their dwelling because they were protected while they were right down here. And no doubt, God is going to do the same thing for Israel as he tucks them away for three and a half years. Do you believe that? That's what this scripture is dealing with. We're going to see it from heaven. And we'll show you in the scripture in a little bit because the Bible said that the heavens will be rolled back like a scroll. The inhabitants of the earth will be able to look up into the sky and see the glorified church and the four groups called out of called out of the earth as we glorify God for seven years, as it were, up there in glory. And they're going to be looking up and they're going to say, they're going to run into the rocks in the caves and say, hide us from the face of him because they're going to see his wrath as he comes for the last three and a half years and punishes the wicked. Somebody say, where do you want to be at? I want to be in this chamber right here. Oh, praise the Lord. It's going to happen. Now, of course, I'm giving you a little bit more detail so you can see it. Can the church say hallelujah? All right, let's read here. About thee, and hide thyself, as it were, for a little moment, mm -hmm, until the indignation be overpassed. This is another terminology of tribulation, the indignation. The indignation will come from who? The Lord. Now, remember, in the book of Revelation, in the fifth chapter, the lamb... The lion, as it were, has a book in his hand. That book has seven seals. The first six seals are open during the first three and a half years of tribulation. The first three and a half years of tribulation primarily has to do with the revealing of the Antichrist. He is going to be coming with flatteries as he comes in on a white horse. He's going to show himself on a red horse, on a black horse, on a pale horse. These simply is symbolic language to reveal, to show us how the Antichrist reveals himself and causes havoc in the earth. But the last three and a half years of tribulation is called the great day of his wrath. This is when he opens the seventh seal. The, the lamb is. He was the only one worthy, saints. He's going to open the seventh seal, and there are three woes, there are seven last plagues and seven trumpets. So they're going to see him sending wrath upon the earth. And eventually he's going to come and every eye is going to see him. And those that pierced him in the side are going to see. And Israel, in this, like we just read in the book of as this prophecy that we're reading, that nothing's going to harm them, all those that did not take the mark. Praise the Lord. We're going to see it from heaven, and eventually we're coming back with him when he punishes in the battle of Armageddon. Do you believe that? If we believe it, somebody say we'll live holy. We'll walk with God because those that walk with God and live holy that are in the secret place, sustain me right now, are coming back with him. And we're going to be on the right side, somebody say, of his judgment. We're going to make up the throne. See, one aspect of the church is that we're the throne. It has to do with judgment. Another aspect of the church, um, the, the, the thought this, the, this alluded me, we're the throne, we're going to make up judgment. Then we're going to be the armies of heaven. That's what I wanted to get to. In the 19th chapter of Revelation, we're going to be the armies of heaven coming on our white horses with him on his white horse. Praise the Lord. Oh, hallelujah. Somebody say hallelujah up in here. We're coming back. And every eye is going to see him. And they, them that pierced him in the side, they'll have nothing to say. Praise the Lord. Now, he couldn't give you all of this information. He did a fantastic job. Praise the Lord. But we're going to give you a little bit more detail so we understand. 
We're in the secret place right now. Stay in it. Stay in the church. Praise the Lord. And it will not come. Somebody say, nigh thy dwelling. It's not going to come nigh us. Why? Because we are in the secret place. They're going to be tucked away in a place, and the devil, we're going to read in a minute, Satan is going to try to get to them, but he won't be able to because God is going to protect them. Praise the Lord. And I'll tell you this in passing. What we need to do is stay out of, as Bishop Paddock used to say, stay out of God's pie. Israel is God's pie. What do you mean, Pastor? Israel is God's business. He is chastising her, getting her ready so that he can take a remnant out of her. He's going to have an earthly seed out of her, and he's going to have 144,000, which is a heavenly seed. He's going to get what he wants. But people need to butt out of God's business and let him whoop her and get her ready. See, a lot of people who deal with prophecy don't understand. You see, we're, there, there's been some elder who deals with Bible prophecy, and they say, if you want to understand Bible prophecy, you need to look at Israel. No, you need to look at the church because God is not dealing with Israel right now. He's dealing with the church. The judgment of Israel has already been written. It has already been set. And that's a whole other Bible class in and of itself called the time of the Gentiles. Praise the Lord. Let me, get, oh, I'm not going to give you all that. All right, verses number, let's, let's, verses number 21, read. It says, and behold, the Lord cometh out of his place. This has to do with him coming out of his place. He's going to come out of his place, no doubt, during the tribulation period, punishing men. But he's going to come out of his place to end tribulation when his feet touches down on the Mount of Olives. It splits into a, a large letter L, praise the Lord. It will be a quarter of a mile wide, 200 miles long. There's eight furlongs to a mile. I don't have time to give you all this. Eight furlongs to a mile or 200 miles long, a valley called the Valley of Megiddo, right over there in Israel, right outside, right in between the Mount of Olives and, it, and uh, the Eastern Gate. When his feet touches down, it's going to concave. All the armies of the earth will be there fighting one another. And when they see him, they're going to try to fight against God in Christ as he comes. And the church, the glorified church coming with him, he's coming out of his place. But they're not going to be able to do anything to him. Now, let me give you this illustration. What type of, uh, how can I say, weapons of war can a man use to kill God? He's a spirit. You can't kill him. If, and if some preacher said that God died on the cross, what kind of foolishness is that? If God died, the, u the universe would disintegrate. God can't die. So you see how vain man is? Praise the Lord. Can the church say hallelujah? So this is what man thinks. They think that they can, the devil has deceived men to make them think that they're smarter than God. Ever learning, but never able to come to the knowledge of the truth. And so when the, when the prophet says in Psalms chapters 2 that why doth the heathen rage and the people imagine a vain thing? The heathen will be the Gentile nations gathered there and the people will be the deceived of Israel. And because believe you me, when the Antichrist comes, he's going to deceive some of Israel. He's going to deceive the nations. And the message of the two witnesses will be simply this. Don't believe the beast. He is the devil. Praise the Lord. And they'll be so vain in their imaginations. If we get to it tonight, I'll show you how stupid the devil is. He actually thought that he could overthrow God. And he's going to implant this in their mind that they can somehow overthrow the majesty of God. Praise the Lord. And he's going to simply speak the words. And the Bible said their eyes shall consume away in their sockets and their flesh off their bones. And one preacher said it'll be, somebody say, goulash. Because the scripture said there'll be the flesh of men, mighty men, captains, kings. So it's going to be goulash. It's going to be a melting pot of all flesh as they stand there. All right. He says, behold, for behold, the Lord cometh out of his place, place of the inhabitation uh, of the earth to... Um, 
Read with me, please. Read. Punish the inhabitants of the earth for their what? Iniquity. The earth shall disclose her dead. Mm -hmm. And she'll no, uh, what it say? And she'll no more cover her slain. It's going to take men of continual labor. That's in the book of Ezekiel. Seven months to bury the dead. Seven months. Somebody say, you, do you want to be there? You better get baptized in Jesus' name and get the Holy Ghost. If you don't want to be there, we better, somebody say, take me to the water. To somebody say, be baptized. All right. Can the church say hallelujah? Now let's drop down. Let's go back to Psalms 91. I guess this may take the most of our Bible study today. Praise the Lord. We're going to go down and now to verses numbers 9 and 10. Then we're going to go to Revelation. I'm going to show you something there. Read here, verses numbers 9. Because thou hast made the Lord, which is my refuge, even the Most High, thine habitation. We already talked about that habitation. That is the church. We have made the Lord our habitation. And for that reason, this will not come nigh our dwelling. Our dwelling will be in heaven. Those that of Israel, that God no doubt is going to have a remnant, it won't come nigh their dwelling because he's going to protect them. For a time of time and a dividing of times. So God is going to protect his children. Now let's go to the book of Revelation and let me show you, show you it there. All right? We want, I think we want the... Um, 12th chapter, memory serves me correct. Then we're going to go to Revelation chapter 6. If you have any questions, you can hold it in the Bible study and then I'll, I'll answer. Nobody's getting away with anything. What verse do I want? Let me see here. All right, we're not going to start with verses numbers one. We know this is woman is Israel. You see that in the 30, if you go back and read the 39th chapter of the book of Genesis, you will see that God gave Joseph the dreamer. Joseph, no doubt, was a type of Christ also in many different ways. He gave Joseph a dream, and you see this same um, language Symbolic language, remember, the book of Revelation is a book of symbols. So this is symbolic language in many cases that you're reading. Let's pick it up here um, in verses numbers 4. What did he say here? 12th chapter, verses numbers 4. Read with me, please. Read. And his tail drew the third part of the angels mm -hmm, and did cast them unto the earth. And the dragon stood before the woman. This woman is Israel. Or this woman is the hundred, and uh, memory serves me correct, yes, the 144,000. And this woman is Israel, excuse me. And this woman is going to produce a man child. This is the heavenly seed of Israel. They'll be caught up before the throne uh, during the first three and a half years of tribulation. But I want to make a point here a third part of the stars of heaven. These stars of heaven are the angels. These are the angels that kept not their first estate, the fallen angels. They are, I'm going to give you four um, terminologies that deal with the fallen angels or deal with the angels. Some of them deal with the fallen angels. Number one is the angels that kept not their first estate. The angels are also called the stars of God in your Bible. They're also called the stars of heaven. They're also called the sons of of God in the book of Job. So what is going to happen during the first three and a half years of tribulation, no doubt, the, devil, the, the, the angels, these demons that roam the earth right now, as we speak, they are able to go up before the presence of God. You see that in the book of Job. When the sons of God, as it were, went up presented themselves before the, uh, before the Lord, the Bible said that Satan came with him. 
So right now, the enemy is accusing the brethren. The brethren is the church. He accuses us day and night. Where does he do that at? He can still ascend up into the presence of God, into the abode of God. And one scripture said, I think it was in um, Job 15 and 15, that the heavens are not clean in his sight. During the middle of the tribulation, God is going to clean the heavens. What this simply means is that he's going to kick the devil out of his ability and the demons, of, and the, demons the ability to go up before the abode of God. These stars are now going to be cast down here to the earth. You're going to read that in the book of Revelation. This is all symbolic language. A third part, how many of the angels fell with Satan? A third part. The stars of heaven, these are angels. Read. Read with me. He cast them to the earth. Where was that? That's right down here. Now imagine this. It's worse, it's bad enough down here. But imagine when the devil and all of his angels are going to be all down here. Won't have any ability to, to ascend before the presence of God. I'm going to show you in a minute. Verses numbers um, 5. And she brought forth, this woman, which was Israel, brought forth a man child. That man child is how many? 144,000. This is not the Jehovah's Witnesses. This is 144,000, or the heavenly seed. Four groups come out of the first three and a half years of tribulation. This is one of them. What you're reading is the middle of the tribulation period after the sixth seal is broken. And I'm going to show you that in a little bit. Read. Brought forth a man child, what? Who was to rule the nation with a rod of iron. Read. And her child was caught up unto God and to his throne. His throne is the church. This is symbolic language. Praise the Lord. This 144,000 is a heavenly seed that are going to be caught up before the throne. Let's see where they're caught up at. Go to the fourth chapter of Revelation. Let me show you where they're, where they're going to be at. Now remember, you're reading symbolic language. So don't think of this literally. The throne makes up the church. You're going to see where they're going to be caught up to. Fourth chapter, verses number six. Read. Before the throne was a sea of glass. So this is one of the groups that are caught up. They're not in the throne. They are before the throne. This is, they are part of what the scripture calls the virgin's companions that follow her. Let me give it to you like this so you can understand. In every marriage... You have witnesses, don't you? Isn't that right? You cannot have a marriage without a witness. Praise the Lord. You have a preacher. You have two people that are getting married, and you got to have how many witnesses? Two witnesses. No, there will be, it will be no different than when God performs the marriage supper of the Lamb. These individuals are the heavenly seed, but they are in a lesser position. They are caught up before the throne or before the church on the sea of glass. They are the virgin's companions in the book of, uh, I think it is in the book of Psalms that follow her. There are four groups. This is one of the groups. We are the bride. We got the best seat in the house. These individuals in another place serve the bride and the lamb, somebody say, day and night. They're not slaves. But they're in a lesser position. They are what the scripture calls blessed and holy. They still are part of the first resurrection, but they don't have what we have. Can the church say praise the Lord? You get, are you getting what I'm saying? Now, if, if I'm not making sense, pray for me. Hallelujah. All right. What verse? Ah, oh, this left it here. What, what did I tell you to go to? All right. Let's, let's finish reading that verse. Before the throne was a sea of glass, like unto crystal. This is all symbolic language. Mm -hmm. And in the midst of the throne and round about the throne mm -hmm, were four beasts. This is symbolic language of the church. With what? Full of eyes before and, the before and behind. This is simply symbolic language that makes the point these four eyes, simply, these four beasts with eyes before and behind, simply a symbolic language that deals with the church in all the earth. God has eyes in every place because he's everywhere beholding the evil and the good. The church is in every four, corner, four corners of the earth. This is all symbolic language. 
Can the church say amen? So this is where this 144,000 is caught up before the sea of glass. They're not in the throne. They're not in the church, but they are before. Somebody say before. They are part of the virgin's companion. Let's finish read here. Let's go back now to uh, verses number 6 of the 12th chapter of Revelation. Are you making, am I making sense tonight? All right. And the woman fled into the wilderness. This is the rest of the children of Israel that did not take the mark of the beast. Praise the Lord. They did not take his mark. God has prepared a place for them in the wilderness. Read for how long? Where she hath a place prepared of who? God. What was the type of that I just told you? When he prepared the children uh, in a place in the land of Goshen, while the ten plagues passed over, uh, as it were, Egypt in that day. Now, he's going to do the same thing here because you're going to see the devil is going to try to get to her, but he can't get to her because it's not going to come nigh her what? Dwelling. A thousand shall fall at the right hand, ten, a thousand shall fall at thy side, ten thousand at, at thy right hand, but it shall not come, somebody say, nigh thee. It's not going to come nigh them. It's not going to come nigh our dwelling because we're going to be in heaven. In the chambers. Read. That they shall what? In, uh, in, uh, that they shall feed her there what? A thousand, two hundred, and well, how many days? Three score days or three and a half, somebody say years. He's done whipping Israel. He's turned back to her. This is when her millennial reign starts. Read, that's Israel. Read. And there was, a, uh, there was war in heaven, and Michael, which is the warring angel, and the angels fought against the dragon, and the dragon fought and his angels. So there's a war in heaven. Read, you're going to see what happens. And prevail not. They did not prevail against Michael and, the, Michael and his angels, or God's angels. Read. Neither were there any what? Place found in heaven. Oh, uh, uh, excuse me. Neither were there any place found anymore in heaven. So this is when the heavens will be clean in his sight. So if he cannot no longer go up before the presence of God in heaven, what do you think he's going to be at? He's going to be right down here. Now, you, do you want to be here? Live holy. Read verses numbers uh, 9. And the great dragon was cast out, that old serpent called the devil and Satan, which deceived the whole world. Now, we're going to get into tonight of the Lord will, and we're going to de de deal with the last work of the sonship is to destroy um, the works of Satan. Praise the, praise the Lord, and to cast death and hell into the lake of fire. Now, the Bible said the devil sinned it from the beginning. And you know how he, he, he sinned from the beginning? The sin of pride. He thought that he could take over the, the throne of God and ascend above the, we're going to read in a little bit, the stars of God, which are the angels. He wanted to be over everything. Now, look at where he's going to end up at. Down here on earth, and eventually he's going into the pit, the lake of fire. Read here. He was cast out into the earth. Read. And whose angels? His angels were cast out with him. So a third part of the angels, or the stars of God, the, um, or the, yes, the stars of God, the demons of hell, whatever you want to call them, they're going to be where, where they're going to be at, down here. And let's see, let's look and see what's going to happen. And what? I heard a loud noise saying in heaven, now has come salvation, strength, and the kingdom of our God, and the power of his Christ. For the accuser of our uh, brethren is cast down. Where is he accusing us right now? He's accusing us in heaven. He can now go up to heaven and accuse us night and day. But it's going to come a time when God's going to shut his mouth and cast him out of heaven. Now, he's cast out of his position, but he will no longer be able to go up before the presence of God. He said, I'm not going to listen to you anymore. I'm going to put you out. 
You're coming down here because I'm done, as it were, getting that which I want out of the earth. All that God is going to have saved at this point will be saved because this is the first three and a half years and the last three and a half begin and no flesh will be saved. Nobody. Can the church say hallelujah? Where do you want to be at? Somebody say in the chamber. Read. We're almost done here. I'm trying to get through this. Which, what, which accuse them bef, uh, before our God day and night. You see, the enemy doesn't take days off. Well, why do, why, let me stop. Why do saints take days off? Why do we take days off? God don't take, I mean, Satan don't take days off. God don't take days off. He's always on the job. Praise the Lord. All right, that's good enough there. Let me give you now, let's go to the sixth chapter and then we'll be done with this. Yes, Revelation. Now we're going to see when the sixth still is broken and what happens. Revelation chapter 6. We're going to go back and keep in mind the stars of heaven here. You're going to see them falling. Now I'm giving you two witnesses. It's going to be the second one here. Sixth chapter of Revelation. Stars of heaven. These are the fallen angels. Verses numbers 12 of the sixth chapter. Now this begins the great day of his, somebody say, wrath. For the first three and a half years, Satan has been revealing himself. He's took peace out of the earth. There's been war. He's hunted men. He's lied. He's cheated. He's done everything that he can in that beast. But now we're going to see when God is going to start punishing the inhabitants of the earth. Verses numbers 12. Read, and I beheld... When he had opened the six seal, who's the he? The lamb. Praise the Lord. Read, the line of the tribe of Judah. Read, six seal, and lo, there was a great earthquake, mm -hmm, and the sun became black as sackcloth of hair, and the moon became blood. Now, Jack Vanapy, or what was it, J J John Hagen, whatever his name was, said that these were, these were uh, blood moons. This is not no blood moon. Praise the Lord. This is not what this is. This is exactly what is going to happen. This is when God begins to pour out his wrath upon the earth. The sun will what? It's going to be darkened. Sackcloth of hair. The moon will turn to blood. And read here. And the stars of heaven fell upon the earth. Remember, this is symbolic language. Now, if this was literal, there are stars in our solar system that are bigger than the earth. So if the stars of heaven fell on the earth, and these were actually stars in our solar system, what, you, what do you think would happen to the earth? It would disintegrate. And how could God punish the inhabitants if when the stars of heaven fell, and, and they were literal stars, who is going to be here to be punished because it will be destroyed. So this is, this is symbolic language that refers to him casting the devil out and, his, and the demons of hell out of heaven. We just read about it in the thir uh, 12th chapter. And remember this, saints, the book of Revelation is not written in order. The Bible is not written in order. You can't pick up the Bible and read it like a novel. So we have to teach it in his order, and I'm trying to put it in his order so you can understand. All right? Can the church say hallelujah? All right? There was an earthquake, a great earthquake. This earthquake, we're going to read it in here, was a universal earthquake. We're going to read it in a minute. All right? The stars of heaven fell mm -hmm, unto the earth. As a, what had happened, even as a, uh, even as a fig tree casteth untimely figs, read, we are shaken of a mighty wind, mm -hmm. and the heavens departed as a scroll. Mm -hmm. When it was rolled together, every, uh, every mountain and island was moved out of its place. This is a universal earthquake over the whole earth. Every mountain, Mount Kilimanjaro, Mount Everest, the Appalachian Mountains, they're going to move out of their place. And you notice what he says here, that saints, the heavens will be open like a scroll. And what do you think the inhabitants of the earth is going to see? They're going to see you in your chambers. 
And we're going to see them being punished for their ungodly deeds. We're going to see the demons of hell down here tormenting men. It's quiet in here. This is what's going to happen. Somebody say live holy. All right. What did he say here? And every, it says every mountain and island was moved out of their place. And this is what's going to happen. The kings, the kings of the earth, all of the great and mighty men that people are worshiping today. Beyonce and all of these individuals that people love so much that walk around here that boast how great they are. When this happens, they will have no words to say. No doubt they will shake their fists at God. They won't repent. They'll, uh, they'll gnaw their tongues for pain and say, you're going to read it here, hide us from the face of him. But there'll be no place to hide because they'll see him as he pours his wrath out. He's opening up the seals on the book and pouring out his wrath. We're going to teach it one day. I don't know how long it's going to take me, but we'll get through it. Can the church say hallelujah? All right. He said, the kings of the earth, the great men, and the rich men. See, when, it, when this happens, it won't matter how much money people have. Praise the Lord. Because money can't buy anybody out of this. We was teaching, we've been teaching on the five works of the sonship. And we made the point, what man can give a ransom for his brother? Nobody. The ransom was already paid, but people, these individuals won't want to receive the ransom. They don't, they, they don't want to receive the five works of the sonship that Jesus came to bring, primarily the first and second one, which has to do with redemption and mediation for our transgression. They don't want to do that. And when we talk about this, people label us as heretics. They label us as legalistic. They label us as people who are just too strict. Praise the Lord. But let me tell you something. I would rather get to heaven and see God and find out there were some things I could have did that I didn't do than wind up here and be looking up in heaven and saying, Lord, if I would have done what I was supposed to do, I could be up there with the saints. Because they'll be able to see us in glory. Can the church say hallelujah? Is anybody scared tonight? Don't be scared. If they say don't be scared. Praise the Lord. It says the chief captains read the mighty men and every bond man and every free man. This is what they're going to say. Hide them. Uh, he said hide themselves in the den and in the rocks of the mountains. And this is what they're going to say. And say unto the, uh, the mo uh, mountains and rocks. This is what they're going to be saying. It's going to be so terrible. They're going to be saying fall on us and hide us from the face. Of what? Him that sitteth on the throne. They're going to see the throne in glory. All symbolic speech. They're going to see the glorified church in heaven. They're going to see him sit, sitting at the right hand, the place of favor, the place of power, the place of the spirit. And they're going to see him sitting judgment. And they're going to say, hide on us. They're going to be try, trying to find a place to get away from the torment that's coming on this earth. Do you not know for five months nobody will be able to die? Did you guys not know that he's going to be dropping um, hell out of the sky the size of refrigerators? All of these things are going to happen. Scorpions with the face of a lion, face like a man, teeth like a lion. All of these things are going to happen during the last half of tribulation. This is all symbolic language. Praise the Lord. But this stuff is going to happen. And we have people today that don't want to be saved. Now, I can't understand that. Praise the Lord. When God is so loving, Sister Key, and so kind, and he's trying to give us all, that, all the opportunity now, and people say, no, I want to do my thing. There was an old song, you guys know, it's your thing, do what you want to do. Now, it is your thing. You can do what you want to do. But remember, at some point, everybody's got to pay the piper. Get a church amen. Oh, Hallelujah. I want to make it. Praise the Lord. So they're going to be what? Running into the caves and the mountains. The Bible said the sun is going to become seven times hotter. Now, i got to give you this as I pass. Now, what is going to happen, saints, is that God is going to stop the weather. 
So wherever you are at in the earth, the weather's going to stop. The, he's going to send the angel. The four winds of the earth are going to stop. So if you live in Arizona and it is 100 degrees in Arizona and he heats the, 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 the sun seven times hotter, this is all in your Bible. Some people don't even read this stuff. They, they, I'm scared of this. I don't want to read this. We better read it. It's going to be 700 degrees in Arizona. And if you are in the Arctic and it's zero, those glaciers out there are going to melt. Praise the Lord. All of those people don't believe this stuff. It's going to happen. And you know what's going to happen? People are going to be walking down the street and it's going to be instant combustion. They're going to burn up. Air conditioning don't work. Praise God. None of that stuff will work. Trust me. You guys don't believe that, do you? <laughs> it's going to happen. Now, this is, is what's going to happen. They're going to run into the rocks, the caves, say, hide us, read, and from the what? The wrath of the Lamb. Now, this is the wrath of the Lamb. Let me show you this also. Let's go to the fifth chapter. I'm going to show you something. Yes, Revelation. Now, saints, he came as a, the Lamb that taketh away the sin of the world. But when he comes in the middle of the tribulation, or as it were, when he starts sending his wrath in the middle of the tribulation period, and at the end of the tribulation period, when he comes, he's not coming as a lamb. You're going to see what he's going to come as now. Let's go to the fourth, fifth chapter, verses number five. Mm -hmm. and, and one of the elders saith, says unto him, weep not. Behold, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the, what do he say here? The root of David has prevailed to open the book. That book that is in his hands has seven seals. Read, and to loose, what? The seven seals. Now he came as a lamb. Now he's coming as a lion. What does a lion come to do? To tear and devour. See, lions don't leave nothing behind. If it's edible, they're going to eat it. So now he's coming here, saints, as a lion. Let's go back, and this will be our last verse. I don't want to wear this out. Verses number 17. And the great day of his wrath is come. This is the great day or the last three and a half years of tribulation. Of his wrath has come. Who shall be able to stand? And the Bible said if those days are not shortened, then no flesh will be saved. That's in the 24th chapter of the book of, book of Matthew. If God did not shorten those days, then nobody will survive. And by the end of the tribulation period, one six, only one sixth of the world population will be left. There are six or seven billion, somebody say seven billion? Let's just say for round figures, there's six billion people on the earth. I know there's more. One billion will be left. But you know where we're going to be at? Somebody say in the chamber. So I wanted to give a little bit more detail. I spent a lot of time on that. Praise the Lord. Now let's get into our subject. Now we're getting right into the Bible study we're supposed to be teaching. Can the church say amen? Anybody have any questions on that? Clear as mud? Praise the Lord. All right, now let's go. We're dealing with the last work of the sonship, which is to bruise the serpent's head and destroy the works of the devil. Let's go to Genesis chapters numbers 3. Can the church say Hallelujah. See, the Bible said, and we're going to read this verse in a minute, that the devil sent it from the beginning. He is the author of sin. Praise God. And we're going to see what happened once Eve transgressed. Oh, excuse me. Actually, Adam transgressed, and the scripture said that Eve was in the transgression. What I say? Third chapter, verse 15. All right, yes. This is a prophecy concerning Christ's coming through the seed of the woman, the seed of the woman, no doubt, was Abraham's seed. Mary furnished the body, praise God. Jesus got in the body, or God got in the body of Jesus Christ to bruise the serpent's head and destroy the works of the devil. Because remember, he tempted her, as it were, or he tricked her, actually. He tempted her and tricked her. She was deceived. She ate. Gave to her husband, he did eat, and what did that do? It brought the whole human family into sin. Can the church say praise the Lord? 
Let's read here verse number 15. What did he say? And I will put enmity between thee and the woman and between thy seed and her seed. Let's stop right there. What happened in the earth, saints, was that when man sinned, he became, as it were, or received the fallen nature. So there were two seeds. There's the seed of the devil, but he was going to bring another seed, which was the seed of Christ. And that seed, saints, was going to destroy the works of the devil. Praise the Lord. And so what, this is what God was going to do through Christ. He had to establish a family inasmuch as the human family fell in sin. So that would mean anything that they were, they were uh, produced would be outside of the will of God. So he had to come to do it. So this is a prophecy, prophecy saying that Satan would not get the upper hand, but he would send the seed of the woman, which was Christ, that would come, no doubt, first of all, I'm going to give it to you like this, through Seth, because Cain slew Abel, right? Seth was born to replace that seed, came through Abraham, came through David. These was all uh, uh, dealing with the godly seed all the way down through somebody say Christ. So he was making the point and letting the enemy know you will not win. But he's too stupid to think otherwise. Read. Her seed, and it shall bruise thy head, and, it shall, and, uh, and thou shall bruise his heel. This simply makes the point that he was going to be above him, and he was going to destroy him. He was going to bruise his kingdom. Praise the Lord. Don't think for one minute that the enemy is getting the upper hand. He's not getting the upper hand. Why? Because right now, saints, you and I who are born again of water and of spirit, the works of Satan is destroyed in our life because we are living free from sin, living free from transgression. Praise the Lord. So this is a prophecy concerning what God was going to do in bringing a godly seed. Praise God. The seed of the woman is Christ here, bringing in a godly seed so that you and I could be redeemed because man could not be redeemed in his present state. Because man had fallen into somebody, say, sin. Now, let's go to, I got to move quickly here. I only got 15 minutes. Let's go now um, to 1 John chapters 3. And verses number 7 and 8. We're running out of time. We're going to have to try to finish this up later. Praise the Lord. 1 John 3 and 7. Little children, let no man deceive you. We are living in that day of deception now. I'll read. He that doeth righteousness is righteous, even as he is righteous, that he is no doubt God. Can the church say hallelujah? So he that doeth righteous is righteous. Be not deceived. Because the Bible said in one place, as it were, ye shall know them by their fruits. Now, what, we're, what we have today is that people are trying to make their own way. But all we have to do is look at their deeds. Everything, saints, in the earth produces after its kind. So if a person is a child of God, they no doubt, saints, will live the way God wants them to live because they are producing a godly life because they belong to God. But if a person is a child of the devil, then they will produce the works of the devil, which is somebody say sin. Verses numbers five, me, uh, eight here, excuse me. He that committed sin, the term committeth is a continuation. He that committed sin is of the devil. Now, somebody say, well, what do you mean, pastor, he that committed sin? Sinners practice sin. That's the reason why I have, um, I'm not confused when I see people do certain things. Because if a person is not walking with God and they are practicing, this has to do with somebody who is an habitual sinner. They just do it all the time. They're what? They're of the devil. Read. 
For what? For the devil sinned, read with me, the devil sinned from the beginning. Read, for this purpose, the Son of God was manifest. What was the purpose of the Son of God being manifest? To destroy, somebody say, this is our, this is our subject here, to destroy the works of of the devil. The works of the devil was sin. Now I want to give you a scripture to show when he talks about the beginning here. Let's go back to the beginning because we're going to see when this began. It started in Satan's heart. He was not created Satan. He's created Lucifer. Let's go now to Isaiah chapter 14. He sinneth from the beginning. Praise the Lord. And then, no doubt, his fallen nature influenced the human family. All right, I want you to catch this. I want you to read this in your Bible. Isaiah 14. All right, I got to abbreviate this. Let's jump to verses numbers 12 here. This is giving us a description of Lucifer, later to be called Satan. Read, how art thou fallen from heaven, O what? Lucifer. Remember, he was not created the devil, he was created Lucifer. He was the most beautiful thing that God ever created. But something happened to him. Read, Lucifer, son of the morning, or he was the first sound of the morning. He was the anointed cherub that covers. That's in Ezekiel chapters numbers 28. He covered all of the works of God's hands. He was the head angel. He was over. It was God, then it was Lucifer. Read. Art thou cut, cast down to the ground. Now, we just read about that, didn't we? He's going to be cast down to the ground. Read. Which did weaken the nations. How did he weaken the nations? He became the tempter. He was Lucifer, then he became the tempter, or the wicked one. Read, for thou hast said in thy heart, this has to do in his mind. I want, he, he says, I will five times. I'll show you this in your Bible. You see, what happens today when a person begins to manifest the works of the enemy, they become self-willed. It's all about them. And you're going to read it five times here. He says, I will ascend up into heaven. I will ascend into heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars. Who are the stars of God? The stars of God are the angels. He says, I'm going to be, I'm going to go up to heaven. I'm going to exalt my throne above God, above the stars of God. I will sit mm -hmm, upon the mountain, the mount of the congregation in the sides of the north. And I don't have time to tell you where that's at in your Bible, but that's the church. The congregation in the side of the north in the book of Psalms is dealing with the church. Read. He says, I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will be like the most high. What did he want to do? He wanted to be God. He says it five times. So this is where he sinned in the beginning. Then he became the tempter. And through his fall, what he did weaken the nations. Now, what God has come to do through Christ, saints, he came to destroy those works. This is the last work of the sonship. He's destroying it right now in you and I. Let's go to 1 Corinthians chapters numbers um, 8. He's destroying it right now in, uh, in, in us, and he's going to finalize it at the great white throne of judgment. Now, let's look at this verse so you can understand. This is the significance of us living for God. I want to show you this in your Bible. Now, people ain't teaching like this nowadays because they have the mentality that we can do whatever we want to do, and that's not the way it is. Praise the Lord. So this is where he sinneth from the beginning. Praise the Lord. And you see this all throughout the world today, the entertainment industry is all about me. Praise the Lord. They want everybody to look at them. They're so great. Their name. They want their name in lights. What did I say? First Corinthians? All right, let me see here. Maybe I'm in the wrong place. Praise the Lord. Is that what I wanted? Romans. Praise God. 
Romans 8. Pray for me. Hallelujah. Praise God. I got, I'm moving too fast here. Yes. Romans 8. Now let's look at what Jesus has done. This is him destroying the works of the devil in our life because we are no longer under the power of the enemy. The Bible said, greater is he that is in you than he that is what? In the world. We have the power over him now because we are walking in the spirit and not obeying the lust of the flesh. Amen? But he himself had to come, Sister Pam, and accomplish redemption for the human family so that these works can be destroyed in our life. Any saint that's bound in sin is, is, has a problem. Can the church say amen? Because sin has no more dominion over us. Death has no more dominion over us. And the product of death, uh, the byproduct of death is what? Sin. Let's read this verse here. Verse number one, wherefore? It says, there is therefore, excuse me, now no condemnation to them. The them is the church, which are, uh, which are in Christ Jesus, who walk not after the flesh. There is no more condemnation. Why? Because sin has been destroyed in our members. Can the church say amen? He's destroyed that work. We no longer work under the motions of transgression. We are, more, we are mortifying the deeds of our bodies. Do you hear what I'm saying today? Verses numbers two. For the law of the spirit, uh, the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus has made us free from the law of sin and death. See, there's two laws here. There's a law in your members. Praise God. There's a law in the members, and that law in your members is the law of the fallen nature. But that law has now been brought under subjection to the Spirit as we yield ourselves to the baptism of the Holy Ghost, and we no longer are under condemnation. Why? Because we're walking in the Spirit and not obeying the lust of the flesh. Can the church say amen? Somebody say, I'm saved. So I can put the whiskey bottle down. Can the church say amen? Why? Because I've been born again. And see... The devil would like, how can I say it as I close here? The enemy would like more than anything to destroy the work of God in the church. But the Bible said the gates of hell shall not prevail against the church. He can't do it. But he is going to go down kicking and screaming. And there will be so many people, Deacon Garland is going to listen to him. And they're going to believe that he is the one. But let me tell you something. Jesus is the one, as the songwriter said. He's the only one. Let him have his way to the day, as somebody say, done. All right, let's finish reading here. Verses number three. For what the law could not do. Now, stop right there. The law could not do it. Why? Because the law gave the knowledge of what sin was, but it did not give the wherewithal to fulfill it. Paul said in the seventh chapter here, the same thing that worked life in him was working death. The law gives life and it gives death. It gives the knowledge which gives life, but it does not give the power to overcome. So he made the conclusion prior to his conversion. He said, oh, wretched man that I am. You can read it in the seventh chapter. Who can deliver me from the body of this death? Thanks be the God through Jesus Christ who giveth us the victory. The victory over what? The victory over sin, which produces death. Now, saints, we are overcoming it right now. The works of the devil. Every day that you live holy. Who was that? Praise the Lord. Every day that you live holy, you're overcoming. We are over, somebody say, overcomers. There is no such thing as a defeated child of God. You can't be defeated when you... Have the victor. Hello? See, victory, saints, deliverance is a mindset. It is a way of thinking. Friday, we're going to talk about the nine elements of our mind. It is a way of thinking. And each and every one of us have to get our mind under the control of the baptism of the Holy Ghost. So that we can do what the scripture said and have a spirit, somebody say a spiritual mind. 
Now in the world today, there's so much foolishness and, uh, and nonsense everywhere that is trying to infiltrate our mindset. Like uh, District Elderator Johnson said, he made a powerful point. When we talk about somebody has a bad spirit, they're under the control of a spirit that is, that is influencing the way they think. You understand? See, there are, there are influences out here in the world. They come through our television set. They talk to us on our jobs. They call us on the phone. And what are they trying to do? They're trying to influence our mind. Hey, girl, let me tell you what happened. Hello, somebody. Somebody said God is walking down, walking up our street. Praise the Lord. But in these settings that we are in right now, God influences our mind to think the right way. And when we think the right way, we can produce everything that God wants us to produce. Can the church say amen? I hope something was said that can help us tonight. Um, anybody have any questions? On any subject or on this topic that we talked about? Yes. Yes. 